Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. Yeah. I probably only have about, I don't know, maybe like 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes? That's fine. Okay. What would you suggest for someone to to put on a resume? What skills that you think people may not know are useful when filling out a, a butcher, their resume and they're a butcher or a meat cutter? What's something that most people would forget to leave or would accidentally leave off that would be good? <clears throat> Let's see. Well, the first thing I think a lot of people leave off is uh, a lot of people don't don't include like a nice description of their responsibilities under each job. So I'll get like a sentence or two, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, I'd really like to see, you know, for instance, let's say your first job was at Whole Foods Market as a butcher apprentice. Yeah. And the first year he spent, you know, he spent six months on the poultry block, six months making sausage, six months making, you know, fabricating uh, pork and lamb and then up to the beef block. I, I'd like to see something like that. Okay. And people never include it. So I, I just feel like there's not enough information on resumes for the most part. Also, please have someone spell check that shit. Okay. When I get a resume that's misspelled and has terrible grammar, which I do every single time. Mm-hmm. I hate it. I feel like I can't trust the person. <laughs> well, that's unfortunate for people like me who are dyslexic. Yeah, but you get you get shit proofread though. I do because I'm smart. Yeah, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, my coping or my, uh, you know, it's like uh, what do you call it? Like people who are dyslexic. Women are statistically supposed to be more dyslexic than men. Or, really? or have a higher percentage. Yeah, sure, for this argument. Um, and but it's it's because it was underreported for so long because sure. women could hide it and like came up with other coping mechanisms or ways to get around it. You know, um, and my way of getting around it was being completely honest and just letting that know in the terms of dating me. Of uh, you will proofread stuff that's a great idea and it's like you know now is that like first or second date material material or is that straight up like like bumble profile it's it's in if it comes up in the back and forth of like texting or messaging Mm -hmm. then i will address it then i will address Mm -hmm. not the proofreading but i am dyslexic and etc um and it, that may be a no go for them, and by all means, if that's the case, then fuck you, bitch. And uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, then if sometimes they'll come up at uh, at a at your first dinner when I just pass the menu over and say, uh, "What's that say?" And yeah, what is this? Okay, and going down the line, what is this? And mm-hmm. steak fritz, steak fritz. Okay, I got that. All right. Um, <laughs> but with my my wife, uh, it was just very apparent because we worked with each other for uh, about a a year or so, or six months before we started dating, and just everyone knew I was dyslexic there, and everyone made fun of me, but she didn't make fun of me. Really? Yeah. Uh, oh, that's really nice. Yeah, I think it was more or less she just felt sorry for me. She's like, who's this guy who can't read and lives with his grandma? I'll tell you who that guy is. He's the guy who put a baby in you. Um, <laughs> and the guy that drinks all those Monster Energy drinks. Yeah. The Wait, guy, no. Or was it Rockstar? Or it was, was it Rockstar like? back then. Two packs, two packs of cigarettes. And she told me, I don't date smokers. And I looked down like a goddamn boss and flicked it like a cool person. And then said, then I quit. And then she walked away, and then I ran over and picked up that cigarette because I don't litter. And uh, I did quit that day. That is a true story. Did you really? Yeah. That happened. And then the uh, the rock stars and all that was, I quit that, that same day. 
And since she's from the Pacific Northwest, she had no problem with caffeine. So I just moved on to coffee and cold brew. <laughs> yeah. And maybe that was her defense mechanism of like getting away from me. Of just like, well, obviously he can't quit these things that are super addicted. But yeah. good job. Yeah. I anyway, what else would you see on a resume yeah. that would you would like to see? Uh, I'd like it if people included their education. I usually don't do that. I'd like it if people would include references that were not friends and family. Yeah, but how do you weed that out? Uh, the, you, you really can't. Because I'll I usually don't call references. I usually call past employers. Well, see, that that's the hard thing, David, that with me, because every job I've gotten in this industry for the last couple of years has been a result of being poached or, mm -hmm. or seeing greener pastures, which has left my current employers in a bad position. Yeah, true. Uh, so I, I don't know what they would say. And also I know some of my current employers have listened to this and uh, some of my subtle stories aren't so subtle when they're the people directly involved. So I'm worried if I were to put someone like that information, like what they would truly say. Cause they could just be like Travis Stocks though. Yeah. Fuck that guy. He left me high and dry. <laughs> well, I don't even include that one guy. Cause I don't, I don't think that, I don't think he really knows enough about anything to be called anyways. Y yeah. But, true. Mm -hmm. Well, but, also you could just put me there. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Yeah. Um, let's see what else is. But then again, I'm you friends know, with you, so David, that would be against your rules. That's true. <clears throat> well, I, uh, I can break my rules. Well, true, you can. What do you call? <laughs> do you call people? Well, I so like a big red flag for me is when I see a resume is when their references also share the last name as them. Um, yeah, no kidding. It's like. Man, you should have a better reference than your mom, unless you're 18 with zero work experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a cover letter goes a super long way. Always include a cover letter that that tells a little, just a, just a tiny bit about what you're doing in that moment, and what uh -huh. your goals are, and how you how you think that you could fit in with their existing program. But you know, I, got, I got an email with a cover, cover letter where a guy said, and I'm pretty sure it was something like, I'm, I'm, I'm positive that uh, I can bring positive change and new efficiencies to your to your program. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just hiring for like a mid-level meat cutter. Yeah. So instantly I knew that, that this guy was going to be a total headache. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because he'd always be like, mm, you know how we used to do it at my old shop? Oh, I hate those guys. Those constantly, guys who just constantly who come in and like, you, you know, think that they could fix systems that have put in place for the entirety of the business. But they have the hindsight of like, well, why don't we do it this way? And it's not like they haven't worked there six months to realize like all the moving parts that make it why they do it that way. Totally. Um that's why I always recommend, and I and I, I gave you the advice if when you start off a new place, be honest with what your transition to power is, what your job is and responsibilities are, and don't exceed that until you're comfortable with what you're hired to do. That's my advice to anyone. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's great advice. Uh, and some people are good at sink sink or swim, but <clears throat> not everybody. Yeah, baptismal by fire is what I call it. Yeah, that's um, pretty accurate. Then, what would uh, what about the the thank you email? Because what was it? Uh, Media Inc. This they interviewed somebody for that company, and this got made all the rounds on Twitter. Where she said, "If they don't send me a thank you email after an interview, they're off my list." No kidding. Yeah, which I think is shitty. Just, but I also always send a thank you email. Yeah, I do too. Although I I get them about one percent of the time. Uh huh. 
Hmm. That being said, the vast majority of, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to even get people to do something other than hand write an application like on their steering wheel in the parking lot. Yeah. You know, what, what, when I worked in, in Vermont, I would just get people like, I don't think anyone who ever worked there, I didn't get the job with a resume. I don't think I ever saw a resume go through that place. <laughs> um, now, th- that being said, I feel like a lot of these people could improve their lives if they just had basic understanding of how a resume was and then how to word the skills that they learned by working in a place like that. Yeah, that's very true. Um, this might be a great forum for us to put together a couple of resume templates and post those for people to fill in competently and you know carefully, thoughtfully. Yeah, because just think about... What what are some things you do? Say you're a cutter at a at a small grocery chain or at a cut and wrap, and your job is is cutting. But are you also in charge of you know inventory? Or you may not be the manager for say, but maybe that manager delegated responsibilities as far as like, hey, your job is to line up what we're going to cut for the day or, you know, so you could put, um, you could include things like that on your resume as far oh, absolutely. as, you know, uh, I don't know how you would word it. What would you say? Uh, well, when I have people on the team, I, I'm, I'm always delegating things that are like solely their responsibility, regardless of whether or not they have a certain bump cap that doesn't need some management. Yeah. So it's like really clear. So I, I honestly would just, I would list all the things that, that you are solely responsible for if there's anything like that. Yeah. And if you know how to like, and just think about things in your, in your weekly or daily work life, like what do you do that you may think is benign, but it could be like as simple as filling out a cold chamber form of like, okay, I got to work this morning and the cooler was at this temperature. So, you know, now you're good at uh, monitoring, uh, you know, and documenting uh, thermal controls. Or yeah, and it it may seem like you're like I'm overselling or spoofing up what what it is you did by checking the thermometer, but it's just basic stuff like that. If you don't have things to put on your resume, or one that are good. Uh, and it's just that stuff translates that if you, because of what it shows me is you understand what a critical limit is. You understand food safety and you understand how to fill out a reviewable document. You know, this actually, uh, uh, you know, sounds very, very simple, but it's surprisingly uh, intimidating for people that have not done it. Yeah. And so, you know, being, you know, being responsible for various, uh, Various forms in monitoring certain conditions through your HACCP plan is uh, is definitely something to include, even if it's not CCPs or anything. Yeah, and then like if you mix your job is like you're you work at the final rail of a slaughter line, but the first thing you do in the morning is mix your uh, antimicrobial intervention and then try trade it you know, then you should include that. Absolutely. You know. Um, yeah, without a doubt. And if you're... If I, if I had someone come into a plant that only, let's say the only thing they had done was completed a, a one-year <clears throat> packaging apprenticeship, but also knew how to titrate chemicals and, and uh, do hazard monitoring, I would hire them in a second. Yeah, because titrating um, beef intervention is is the same as try trading chick X is the same as try trading cleaning st- stuff. Oh and, yeah. You know, it translates. If you know how to follow simple rules and fill out documents that are, and it's not even like filling out a document, like a lot of, a big thing that was scary for me in this industry when taking the next step is not like, I'm not filling out big old reports because I am dyslexic. And so it's just like, what I'm doing is checking boxes putting 
Ys or Ns, if something was good or not. And if there's an NR, I have a template for me to be able to respond to it. And then all I have to do is like just real quickly describe it. And in my case, then I just use Siri and then copy and paste it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if, if you're someone that works in, say, a, a retail exempt or grocery space, <clears throat> and you happen to take care of like the grind logs and maybe the the cooler temp logs, mm-hmm. I think that even just that is enough to get you started as a QC type in a larger plant. Absolutely. And, it, you know. and a lot of things translate. My brother was running a kill floor. And then now he runs a uh, QC at a um, yogurt plant. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just different tests and different things with way counts and things. I don't even know. But he said, you know, he, he, he transitioned well into it. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I think that any meat cutter that or or anyone that works in this industry that wants to look at having a future <clears throat> in it and make some actual career and money should highly consider taking some amount of time and uh, working as a QC tech or QA or some other kind of administrative or peripheral position in the in the business in order to kind of broaden their horizons and understand food safety a little more. Yeah. And if you're working at a place that does these simple monitorings and you're finding that like you know, familiar, familiarize yourself with it and like, don't do it in a way like where you try to take someone else's responsibility, but just try to understand what that person is doing and the, the process is behind it, you know? Um, and I encourage anyone out there who works at a plant that follows a HACCP plan to be versed in that HACCP plan and have your employer, you know, go over it with the staff to have a better understanding of it. And then you could use that as, you know. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I I definitely, uh, I think it happens a lot where, you you know, low level or entry level management gets thrown into running some sort of floor, whether it be processing kill or whatever. And, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, they get promoted maybe a little bit earlier than they ought to. And they don't get HACCP certified, and they haven't had monitoring ex- experience, and uh, they get thrown into management and have never read the HACCP plan and don't understand how to make it work. So, you know, it's it's like you don't have all the tools that you need in order to get the job done. You're just kind of treading water or working extra, extra hard um, when there's a framework to manage mm-hmm. within that, that really, really helps to understand uh, your plan. So. Anybody out there that's a kill for you, especially that doesn't know your house of plan, uh, demand that your employer make some time for you to uh, understand it and, and be trained in it. Yeah, definitely. I, I And I, yeah, there's a lot of good things online that you can also apply to your everyday work. In this episode, we're more, we're talking about like, resume building material in case you for some reason want or just fishing you just want to see what else is out there or, yep. or maybe you're comfortable or maybe you want to build a resume like document to ask for that raise at uh at your current employer you know that's right uh but just think about the things that you do and skills like and then even if it's just a very entry level job that you're applying for you coming in with that piece of paper is going to be head and shoulders above everyone else because a lot of places they'll, you know, cut and wraps and stuff don't really have resumes. Yeah. So true. I know I've gotten a couple jobs on a handshake. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, David, I years ago, I had the pleasure of reading David's resume when he gave it to me looking for employment. Uh, <laughs> and then I handed it to my the person who was in charge of the office at the time, who was my wife, and she read it and then gave me the gist of it. And then I put it in a jacket pocket and forgot about it. And then about, <laughs> a, and then about like... A year ago, I 
when I was moving, no, like six months ago, I was going through that jacket and, and rediscovered your resume, David. Oh, did you really? Yeah. I, I don't know if I thought about sending you a screenshot of it or, I mean, or taking a picture of it or, or if I didn't. Yeah. yeah, I think about what was on that resume then. It was a little thinner. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then that's another thing is like, because I, for the longest time, wanted my resume to fit on one piece of paper. Yeah. Well, they they tell you in high school that's what you want. Yeah. It's actually not true. You want you want five sheets of paper, dude. <laughs> I mean, I'll take a, a short, like a novella, mm-hmm. a full history. No, I I mean, I, I just don't care if it's one or two. I'm fine if it's stapled. If it, if it gives me all of the information that I'm looking for. Well, I also think our high school that I don't know what current standards are. There's people who work for huge companies that can make the judgment call on that. Um, But when we were in high school, that was also dealing with high school students who didn't have work experience for one. And so they're putting stuff like, oh, community service with old people or something on their resume. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then now, like millennials statistically have way more jobs than previous generations because they are unhappy with uh, not being satisfied at their jobs. Whereas previous generations just like accept being unhappy. (laughs) Yeah. That's interesting and true. Yeah. Where it's like, you know, now I'm going to get on that case where it's like, uh, you know, people always say like, "Oh, they're millennials are entitled." They're this. It's like, nah, dude, your your generation is just complacent with being miserable. And yeah, they're it's true. And even because technically we are millennials, David. Um, oh yeah, yeah, we're at the upper end. I mean, I still remember life without a cell phone, but it didn't it didn't last long. Yeah, but like, where if I'm unhappy at work or if I get stagnant, I'm gonna I'm gonna see what else is out there. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think they're saying that people have like 2.7 careers in their job now, people that are under 40. Yeah. What they projected to have. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always heard that people change careers three times in their work life. You know. uh, I think that's new for us. For people our age. Yeah. I was a tile setter. It was my first career. And then now I'm a butcher. Is a career. All right. If you were to change your career, David, what would you do? <coughs> and why? Like totally not meat or agriculturally related yeah, at all. Just, or say, just say you get burnt out. Or say you're chasing money. Or just say like, you you want something else? What would you do? No, no food, no farming, no killing, no cutting. No, no teaching either. <laughs> no teaching either. Mm-mm. I would dick model. Got it. No, <laughs> I would. Uh, let's see. I'd probably learn about um, electronics, or I, I, I think I'd, I think I'd try to become an electrician. Or like an electronic technician, like someone that re- uh, repairs small circuits and would probably somehow get into the audio industry. Or maybe counseling. Counseling? Yeah. Co- like a guidance counselor for high school kids? Uh, yeah, maybe not for high school kids, though, because, you know, I don't know about that. Um, but... Maybe for like men with anger issues or something. Big burly men. Yeah, yeah. It'd be like uh, we call it. We call it like the something like the the bear trap or like the bear sanctuary or something. I like it. Or bear yeah. your feelings. But yeah, God, there it is. See, you're the idea guy. I like that. Um, me, I've I've been entertaining the idea lately about what fields I, I would go into. And 
I, I, I think I, I would enjoy being a highway patrol officer <laughs> or a beat cop. Yeah. Like, I mean, Melissa would hate that. Uh, well, it, so like, there's this part of me where it's like, I certainly did not enjoy the police when I was growing up. And no, everyone in America has an opinion on one on them one way or the other. Um, but I feel like I could, I was telling this to Melissa and I was like, I feel like I could do like, just be a good, sincere person. And like, she's like, well, you're not going to change the world that way. And I'm like, yeah, but I could change individuals experiences. And that, that, that would be important. You know, I'm not trying to save the world. I'm just, if, if I were to be a cop, it'd just be like, maybe one person could say they didn't have a shitty experience. Um, yeah. And then, uh, but then I was thinking about it more that I don't seriously want to see a ton of um, opioid overdoses and suicides. Uh, yeah. Because that's what I feel like cops mostly see in this area. I think, uh, yeah, I think mostly. And I think I am mentally prepared possibly from working slaughter. Maybe not. I'll, I have no idea. Um, but uh, it, it just is something I, I certainly wouldn't want to see. This is just speaking of the ether. I'm not going to be a cop anytime soon. Maybe. I could see you as a golfer as well. Like a pro golfer? Yeah. Well, I'm not good at golf, so I don't see that. Yeah, but... I mean, like, I, I could see the personality sort of thing. Like, a mix between Happy Gilmore and Shooter McGavin at the same time. Yeah. I I don't know. We should, <laughs> we should start a podcast network and then have a podcast that's completely not meat-related and see what that turns out to be. That sounds fun. Yeah. I think it would be. It'd probably be a lot like this. Yes, because we're not talking about <laughs> meat at all right now. But we could see, like, something in pop culture and comment on it or we can microdose and comment on things yeah that sounds great <laughs> all right oh david we, we went past here yeah i know i gotta go do all right anything you want to say before tomorrow? we get out <clears throat> i'd like to talk about gas flush sometime soon about what gas flushing what's that well, you know, like if you're if you're packaging with a, a tray pack, oh. you can flood with some combination of carbon monoxide or nitrogen or oxygen. Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> I heard a story about somebody who recently bought a couple of swing lid style vacuum, you know, chamber yeah. sealers. Uh huh. <clears throat> and they talked to their. Uh, this fellow was telling me that he talked to a sales rep, told him that oh, I want to do ground beef and steaks and all this, and I want gas flush for it to keep it keep it nice and red. And yeah. the sales rep knew that this guy packed in vacuum bags, sold him the machines, uh-huh. and then when he got there, realized that you can't have gas flush if you're vacuum sealing at a high vacuum. Because you have to have room for the atmosphere. Yeah, the ninety-nine percent vacuum. <clears throat> well, it's not enough. It's not enough room. Yeah, no, that one percent is certainly not enough. Oh yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's 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 like for bags of chips and stuff like that. So <clears throat> this guy that I know got got kind of screwed a mm-hmm. little bit and uh, had some questions for us. So maybe next time we could talk about vacuum flushing. Yes, and hyperbole. So yeah, that's right. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode about resumes and just remember, you know, be truthful. You don't want to get into a situation where you're in over your head. Um, but you also want to highlight unique skills that are, that you Maybe you think are unimpressive, but other people will. An example is like, don't get in over your head. Today I built a uh, bed for my son. I'm not a carpenter. 
I wouldn't put that I'm a carpenter on a resume, even though I did work as a rough, rough framer for a while. So maybe I'd put that. But the truth is, this bed came from Ikea. Same way as gardening or mowing your lawn doesn't make you a skilled landscaper. It's at you to use your discretion. I recommend using platforms like LinkedIn, Indeed, Glass Ceiling, and Monster to help you. You know, it's always good to have feelers and alerts and things like that. And you also need to define what success means to you. What do you want to accomplish in your work environment? What's worth, you know, leaving one company for? Now, from an outsider's perspective, people would maybe think that I have success in this industry. And I've had people ask me what, you know, many times and talked about it, what can I do to be like you to acquire your skills? And I tell them, honestly, the past I did, and then I see the look of disappointment in their face because they don't want to work that hard. Until next time, keep your knives sharp and live in the margin.